Welcome to another edition of RV Talk Live. We're coming to you from Edmonds, Washington, which is just north of Seattle, right on Puget Sound. Uh, you're uh, probably, if you haven't seen it right by now, we, I think we've got a live shot of, or almost live shot of a ferry, our Washington State Ferry, which uh, leaves from right near our studio here and, and crosses over to the Kitsap Peninsula to the little town of Kingston, which is the gateway then to the Olympic Peninsula and Olympic National Park. Uh, the Washington State Ferry System is the largest passenger uh, automobile uh, fleet in the United uh, ferry fleet in the United States and third largest in the world. And uh, yes, RVs of any size are welcome there. Um, we have a good show for you today. We'll be talking about RV tires with RV tire expert Roger Marble. Uh, if you're registered at YouTube, you'll be able to participate in the chat, which is on the right side of where you're viewing this webcast. And so be sure to uh, ask any questions, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. And if we can't answer them here, we'll take care of them. Uh, uh, and, and Roger will take care of him in his blog, and, and he'll tell you about that. This will be our last live webcast until the fall. We'll take a little break. We've got a lot of vacations going on here. I come back with a new, improved version. Uh, we'll also be switching to 6 p.m. on Sunday evenings instead of this 9 a.m. on Saturdays. Uh, a lot of our uh, viewers are on the East Coast, and by noon on a Sunday or on a Saturday, they're out playing around and they're not sitting around watching a live uh, webcast. So I think that'll be a big help um, in uh, allowing some of you to, to watch and participate. Uh, but in the meantime, be sure to check out our channel uh, at YouTube, uh, which is simply youtube.com uh, slash RV Travel. We're putting up dozens of new videos every month, and uh, they're very helpful. And I think you'll get a lot of uh, good information there. Again, be sure to subscribe to the channel. You see a little button on your screen there, so you'll, be, you'll get a notification when new videos come up and you'll know about new uh, uh, future webcasts. Before I introduce Roger, I'd like to thank our sponsor, which is Lawrence RV Accessories, which has been selling RV safety products for nearly 10 years, including its tire, tra tire tracker, tire pressure monitoring system, which I personally use on my own RV and I highly recommend. Uh, everyone should have a tire pressure monitoring system. Uh, visit lawrencerv.com to learn about other great products including voltage and surge suppression systems and electrical adapters and converters. And just a reminder, uh, we'll be giving away the book RV Camping in State Parks, which is uh, right there. We'll be giving that away in a little bit. Uh, you'll need to be able to participate in the chat on YouTube uh, to participate and answer the question which will be about our national parks. I'll give you a little heads up on that. Okay, our guest today is Roger Marble, who is joining us from the town of Kent, Ohio, which is right near Akron, which is sort of the tire capital of the United States. Before retiring, Roger spent 40 years in the tire industry, working for a major manufacturer, developing tires for applications in North, Central, and South America. During his career, he worked on many kinds of tires, heavy truck, passenger, light trucks, and indie type cars. Today, among other things, he is the editor of uh, the blog RVTireSafety.com. Hi, Roger, and thanks for joining us. Morning, and I am not hearing Roger. Okay. Okay. Um, Roger, I assume everybody else is hearing you, so I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, a very simple question, and that is, how are RV tires different from tires we use on our automobiles? Other than size, basically, they're almost identical. Uh, they, some of them may have a little better long-term ozone protection on the sidewall. But other than that, a tire is a tire, just the size is different. Roger, I'm not hearing you. Um. Okay. Okay, let me... okay. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, now I got you. So did you answer that question? Yeah, uh, basically the uh, tires uh, for RVs are just the same as your tires for your passenger car or light truck uh, or heavy truck if you owned one of those, except uh, the size, obviously. Uh, some tires may have a little bit more ozone protection in the sidewall, but basically a tire is a tire. You've got to put air in it carry the load. 
Okay, all right. Okay, what we're going to do here today is we're going to basically go through some questions that we've received. We were, you know, we get a lot of letters, and a lot of them kind of follow the same, the same theme, the same questions. So we've picked about a, about a dozen of the most asked questions we get here about RV tires. So let's just uh, kind of get into each one of those, Roger, and uh, and you're the expert. So uh, go ahead and take a stab at all these. So here's one: um, Is covering your tires when parking for a few days worth the effort? Definitely. Uh, I Actually, the first purchase I made for my RV was a tire pressure monitoring system, and the second was a set of tire covers. Uh, shielding the tires from UV and, more importantly, from the heat from sunlight uh, will extend the life of your tires. Uh, a scientific fact, if you will, is that Every 18 degrees increase in tire temperature doubles the rate at which a tire ages. And most people with RVs know that tires age out before they wear out. So you don't want to accelerate the aging of your tires. Okay. Um, good, good, good. Um, okay, here's another one. I have heard about the importance of knowing the real weight of our RV. Does this mean I need to have it weighed each trip. I certainly don't weigh mine each trip. Um, no, you, you, you definitely do not need to weigh it each trip. Uh, if you do a competent job of getting the actual weights on each tire on your RV because they are not equally divided between the axles or side to side on any one axle, uh, there can be a pretty large difference because refrigerators or generators are on one side or the other. Once you know you've got a reasonable balance and you know you're not overloading and have decided what the proper inflation is, you're only going to change by a couple hundred pounds year to year unless you do some major remodification of the RV. After that, just running across the scales once a year to make sure nothing significant has happened is all you need to do. But one time, with it fully loaded, you do need to do the effort of learning the actual loads on each tire. And load turns into heat, and heat's the number one killer of tires. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, remember, those of you watching, if you've got a question for us right now, there's uh, nobody's uh, put up any questions. If you've got some for either Roger or me, probably Roger, because he's the expert, um, please, uh, we'll get to them now. I, I can guarantee it'll get a little busier later and uh, we won't be able to get to all the messages. So if you do have something pressing you want to ask, do it now. Um, a, another one here on uh, tire pressure monitoring systems, TPMS is the acronym. Uh, what should I, sp uh, basically, should, why should I spend the money when I can just, uh, you know, thump the tire to, uh, to see that it's, uh, that it's okay? Well, we've actually done some tests getting experienced over-the-road drivers, letting them thump a couple of tires, and for the most part, they're lucky if they're within 20 PSI, which is way too far off. The tire pressure monitoring system will tell you if you pick up a screw or nail as you leave the campground and a leak starts, two hours down the road, you're flat and you've lost the tire. Thumping your tire, even checking it with a gauge every time you stop, is fine, but there's nothing saying you don't get a damage uh, as you leave the parking lot or you don't have an air leak from your valve at some other time. It's cheap insurance. A TPM can give you advance warning in enough time to avoid a major failure, uh, which can lead to thousands of dollars of damage to your RV. So just has to save it once over the life, and you can keep your tire pressure monitoring system and move it from RV to RV. So they can definitely pay for themselves. Uh, and there's a lot of post, posts about people having done that. Um, are these pretty easy to install? And if you have, you have a, say you've got a truck that's got six wheels on it and you're pulling something that's got a, some more wheels, I mean, is there any limit to the number of, of tires you can monitor? No, you, most of the systems can handle uh, 10 sensors. Hmm. Uh, you get one for each tire, and if, you, if you're pulling a, a car behind your, your large RV, you can add those too. So uh, when you buy, you get one for every tire that's on the ground, 
and you can get one for your spare. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, they are easy. Basically, you screw them on, and there's a, a procedure. Uh, they're slightly different between manufacturers, but I would say a half hour, read the instructions, and everything's ready to go. And once you've done it once, then it's pretty easy after that. Okay, uh, here, uh, here's another question. Um, I have a 28-foot fifth wheel trailer. Should I set my tire pressure based on actual tire load like motorhomes do or follow the inflation pressure uh, shown on the tire sidewall? This is a great question, uh, Chuck. Uh, I have two or three posts on uh, rvtiresafety.com specifically about trailers versus motorhome and, and the right pressure. Trailers are different than motorhomes. They have most of them have two axles right near each other so that when you're going around a corner there are side loads that go way above the side loads put in tires on a motorhome so trailers should run the pressure on the sidewall of the tire and most trailers will see that that pressure matches the pressure on their tire placard or certification label affixed to the rv Okay. Motorhomes can run a lower pressure than the max on the tire most of the time, and they need to, they can do the inflation based on calculations and looking at the tables based on real loads. And I've published stuff on that, and actually if you go to rvsafety.com, my picture's there, and right under that is my email send me an email with the numbers and I'll help you walk through the calculations. Okay. Um, uh, here, here's a, a, another question related to uh, tire pressure monitoring systems. Um, if, they, if someone has a tire pressure monitoring system, uh, they're asking why would they need a hand pressure, I guess, the, uh, ch to, check their, to check the pressure. Well, with, as with almost everything man-made, they can fail. Hmm and you probably will be topping up your tires one or two or three pounds once a month or once every six weeks and so you need something you can measure as you're putting the air in your tire mm. this allows you to keep an eye and if all of a sudden there's some major change you have the hand gauge as a backup for the tire pressure monitoring because they should be within three or four psi of each other okay um do the how long do these things last, these systems last? Well, the tire pressure monitoring systems, basically, a lot of the advertisers talk about three to five years on battery life. Uh, some systems shut off uh, when there's no motion. Others have a very low uh, battery drain. Uh, I'm not a full-timer. When I park my RV over the winter, I just unscrew the caps and pull the battery out. Uh, so there's no drain. Uh, right now my batteries are four years old and they're still working great. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but batteries are a couple bucks a piece, so they're really easy to change and keep it up. And other than that, uh, I've had no problems. Uh, in my post about what's the best TPM, one of the things I suggest is look at the warranty. Uh, that's a reasonable measure of the quality of the unit, at least as far as the person selling the unit. Mm -hmm. uh, they only give you six-month warranty. Obviously, they don't believe the product's very good. Yeah, good advice. Um, I want to just take a, a quick little break here and, and read a, a disclaimer here, and that is that on this show, for those of you who are watching, please, either live or in the archives, just understand that we're kind of talking off the cuff here, and uh, these are we're doing our best job, but always when you're going to be doing something on your RV, making a major decision, talk to a professional because uh, we could uh, offer some incomplete information here or um, make a mistake. <gasps> I don't think we'll ever make a mistake, but we could. Um, okay, uh, let's see here. What is the best tire pressure gauge? I mean, we, I, we always have, I always have those little manual things you push in and then they come out the edge. Is that uh, well, those fine? the problem with the uh, slip stick ones, the thing where you put it on and a little stick extends out, um, a, a bit of dirt, or actually if you go and lube it, that will affect the reading. Uh, when I've run comparisons, that I've been to rallies and RV conventions where I offer to check against calibrated gauges, I find about 15% of the gauges are off by more 
than 5 psi. And that's kind of my personal position that if it's off by 5, you now have a tent peg. Um, good digital tire pressure gauges are available. Um, Sears, Amazon. Uh, I've got links on my web to some suggested ones, and I've got links suggesting how to make, have your own master calibrated gauge uh, for less than $15. So digital is definitely my first choice. It's easier to read. Uh, mm -hmm. With life experience, your eyesight is not as good as it used to be. So reading those little lines is hard. I like the big numbers. Digital. Yeah, I, I suppose going on Amazon and reading all the reviews might help. I mean, is it necessarily the more expensive ones are better, or is that really no, uh, not matter that no, much? No, I've seen, I've seen some guys boast about spending $300 on a tire gauge. Really? I spent, I got them on sale, $9.95. That's what I use. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's um, $300. How do you spend three hundred dollars? What does it do for three hundred dollars? I mean, sometimes I have to wonder. It has a big name associated with yeah. uh, a NASCAR racing group, and some people think that makes it better. Not necessarily. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Um, I have read that black tire covers do a better job of blocking UV rays from the sun. What do you think? And the UV rays are the bad guys here, aren't they? They will do lots of damage. So are the black covers better? No. And uh, I had some people ask that after I posted on, on my blog about white covers and keeping the heat down. Um, the, I did some black comparison, and the black covers cook the tires. Yes, black covers will block UV. A piece of plywood will block UV. A big sheet of cardboard will block UV. But you don't want to be carrying around a big sheet of cardboard. Mm -hmm. So if you're confronted with black or white, go with white because black will heat the tires. And matter of fact, there's the results of our gauge when you see at 98 degrees was the cover temperature. When I pulled the cover off, I saw 99 degrees. Mm -hmm. 30 minutes later, that tire was 136 degrees. Mm. That means it is aging four times faster because the age rate is geometric. So keeping the tires cool is, is pretty important. My tires are seven years old. They have spent most of their life covered when they're not driving down the road. Um, even though one side is almost always exposed to the sun, no cracks. They look great. What, what do you mean geom uh, aging is geometric? Explain that. When you increase the temperature by 18 degrees, the chemical reaction rate, the age at which, uh, the rate at which tires age, doubles. So if you go up 18, it's twice. If you go up 36, another 18, it's now four times. If you go up another 18, it's now eight times. Mm. So it, it can, uh, you can imagine how hot a tire gets, full sun, Arizona, California, right. anywhere down south, full sun um, for months at a time. You just took a couple of years off the tire light. Wow. Will you notice that? I mean, will you notice the, will you, will you see cracking in the, the side of the tire? Is that noticeable? Or? Yes, you will see cracking and... Uh, uh, Real small cracks. Matter of fact, uh, Michelin has uh, some stuff available online that with some pictures. But basically, if the cracks are really small, uh, it's it's normal. But when you can start getting your your fingernail into it, at that point, uh, it's definitely time to have a tire expert inspect mm -hmm. your tires. Okay. Here's a here's a, a question. Astrid Beerworth uh, asked. Uh, I, I, I think there may be some typos on here, but is a, I think she's asking, is a truck tire the same size as a trailer tire? Does that make sense? Or am I not reading yeah, this? Um, I understand the question. Uh, no, basically the uh, tra most trailer tires are 15 or 16 inch. Uh, we're talking RV trailers. 
most class A's are 22 and a half inch rim, and the class C's, uh, they're basically built on uh, van chassis, and they're 16 inch. So, uh, no, trailer and class C's are smaller than the big class A's, and big class A's, 22 and a half, are about the same size as heavy truck. Heavy truck over the highway, uh, you know, big semi truck mm -hmm. down the road will be 22 and a half, 24 and a half. Okay. Um, all right, here's another one for you. Um, uh, why should I worry about recording the tire DOT serial numbers? Okay, the DOT serial number, and every tire on the highway has a DOT serial. Um, there's three letters, DOT, followed by anywhere from eight to uh, 15 letters and numbers. Those are the numbers, if you ever hear about a tire being recalled, that number says this tire gets replaced, or no, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. The last four digits translate into the year, the date of birth, year and week, uh, and I have that with pictures on rvsafety.com, rvtiresafety.com, and uh, in case you have questions about how to read it or how old your tire, but the series doesn't change, but sometimes it's on the back side, it's hard to get to, but one time, uh, if you need to, find a local 10-year-old, give them a dollar and flashlight to climb under and record the D full DOT on every tire. Getting it on one tire does not mean all the tires on your RV are the same. Have that, write it down in your data book somewhere. Okay. Hey, you know, we, we didn't get a question here, but I want to ask them before I forget. Um, is it wise to rotate the tires on your, on your uh, motorhome travel trailer? Basically, the, the advice is, unless you have an alignment problem, uh, certainly with Class A's, you don't need to. Um, I don't see any particular reason to rotate tires, again, unless you have an alignment problem. Uh, the tires are going to age out before they wear out. Um, I had an alignment issue on the front of mine, got it measured, confirmed it was an alignment issue, and I just, because I can, rotated the tires. Uh, I didn't need to, but I, you know, I do some things with tires that the average person wouldn't. Okay. Um, on, on, again, I got another question that's coming to mind on, on the dual, on your duels on the back. Should those all be those should all be evenly matched, right? I mean, they should all absolutely. Yeah. Uh, some people, uh, you know, they know something about road crown. That's where the road slopes. To allow water to drain off um, and they think oh well because of that road slope I've got to put more air on the inner or the outer and they, they get confused but no the proper thing is every tire on each axle should have the same inflation whether it's the inner or outer of duels that are in the rear all four tires should have the same cold inflation based on load for motorhomes and on the front, um, again, based on load, th both those tires on the front of a motorhome should be the same. Trailers don't have duals, but they'll have four tires. But each tire on any one axle, both tires should have the same inflation. You know, I mean, this may be as a maybe this is a really stupid question, but what if I'm in the middle of nowhere and I um, somehow I end up with only three? only have the ability to have three tires on the back of my dual. What I, I mean, I've got to get to a gas station 50 miles away. Um, do I run two on one side and one on the other? I take one off? I mean, I, I know that. I've never even heard this question, but I'm just curious. What would you well, do? Well, you may not have heard the question, but I've heard it more than once. Mm. I've seen it in print. People that you might think know stuff, uh, say, oh yeah, you know, just slow down and, and drive carefully. Uh, the reality is, if you are up near the max load of the tire in a dual application, and you remove one tire, the math that engineers use to determine loads and inflations says you are limited to a maximum speed of two miles an hour. So, if you're stuck, and you don't have a road service and you can't raise anybody 
and you only have one tire uh, two miles an hour, or you are doing damage, and the one remaining tire will be scrapped. I see. Okay. Um, here's a question that came in, um, uh, and I'm kind of my, missing a little bit on the screen here. It says, uh, Roger, are there any tire treatments uh, that you could use for the tire to stay flexible and extend its life? Um, and oh, I guess that's yeah, all, the I, only part I, I can read there. Plan. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of products on the market that people claim are almost magic. You know, spray this on your tire and it'll protect it from everything. Well, it doesn't protect it from heat. It may protect it from ozone and UV a little bit. But this is, think about it like suntan lotion. Can you put some suntan lotion on you in the morning and never worry about replacing the suntan lotion during the rest of the day? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it doesn't work. I mean, it'll work a little bit. Yeah. But it's not forever. Yeah. Um, there are some things that put on tires that actually damage the tires. If it says petroleum distillate or silicone, uh, don't use it. Wash the advice is wash your tires the same way the wa you wash the paint on your car or RV. Water, soap, soft rag. Okay, um, I'm going to take a little break here and just uh, again say I want to thank our sponsor today, uh, Lawrence RV Accessories, who make a very fine uh, or sell a very fine tire pressure monitoring system called the Tire Tracker. Uh, thanks to our friend Daryl Lawrence there who uh, is uh, supporting us in these, this early effort on our uh, live webcasting which we hope to get continue for years and years and get better and better but as I said before we will take, be taking about a month and a half off. We'll come back with new features and uh, for the fall. Okay, uh, this one I did already. Okay, here's one, Roger, I bet you have heard before. I have read a lot about China bombs on trailers. Are tires made in China really that bad? As with any product, some are better than others. But the tires made outside the United States, which are predominantly made in China due to low cost, get pretty much of a bad rap. Every trailer, if, if every trailer made gets tires made in China, mm -hmm. then every trailer that has a failure is on a tire from China that's failed. Therefore, everybody thinks, oh, the China tires fail a lot. But the reality is that you don't have a comparison. You don't have 25% made in China, 25% made in Canada, etc. So if 98% of the tires come from China, why would you be surprised that 98% of the failures are mm -hmm. on tires made in China? Um, now, the quality control, I know I have tested some tires made in China. They pass all the same tests required of any tire, Michelin, Goodyear, Bridgestone, Cooper, General, it doesn't make any difference. If it's on the highway in the United States, there are a set of regulation tests that the manufacturer has to certify they pass. So tires made in China can pass. Um, are all of them going to pass? I'm certainly not going to claim that. I'm not going to claim that every tire made in the United States is going to pass. But those are the goals of the tire companies is to have their tires pass. Because if they don't, there's going to be a recall, and those are expensive. You know, I, I talked to a guy once, a, a manufacturer, and, and he was just kind of chatting, and he said that uh, uh, one of the things that people never never check when they buy an RV is they'll, they'll check everything, the, the bed, the layout, the, what it looks like on the outside, but nobody looks at the tires. So he said he could put tires on a, or I don't think it was him, but he says there are people that will fit, buy these $10 tires and put them on a travel trailer. Yeah, I'm, I, I agree with you, Chuck. Uh, I've read some, some various RV forums, and I usually say people buy the bling, the mirrors, the fancy lights in the ceiling, as you said, the beds. And when it comes to the safety items, which to me is tires, mm -hmm. um, and maybe the hitch, 
they, you know, they just kind of assume, oh, everything's fine. So uh, no, they, they, people really need to try to educate themselves a little bit on tires. Again, another question um, that I just came to mind, and that is, um, is patching a tire, you get a, a nail in it, is patching a tire, is that good enough? Is it going to be strong? Are there certain places that fail, you may want to need a new tire? Um, there are guidelines, Chuck, um, for proper repairs and improper repairs, and it's pretty universal in, in the tire industry and, and the federal regulators um, that a combination patch and plug, in other words, a patch applied on the inside of the tire to keep the air in, and a plug to seal the hole. Don't forget, we've got steel belted radials for the most part out mm -hmm. there, and if you don't plug the hole, the water can get in and you can rust the steel belts. The biggest problem with the cheap plugs you can buy at the local discount store don't require you to inspect the inside of the tire. I've got some pictures of uh, some examples on, on the blog rvtiresafety.com showing very significant damage on the inside of the tire that was not seen. In one case, it wore through the inner liner and was cutting through the piece of material that was inside the tire, it was cutting through the body ply on the inside of the tire. Yet the tire was plugged by somebody that charged, you know, low dollars. Uh, so the only thing I'd ever plug would be my wheelbarrow tire. Okay. All right. Okay. It's time for our little giveaway here. And we're going to give away this uh, really good book, which is. Uh, RV camping in state parks. It's got all the, the places where you can camp with an RV uh, in a state park um, in the United States from the folks at Roundabout Publishing. We sell this at rvbookstore.com. And I have a very simple question for you. What was America's first national park? And if you are able to answer that on our live chat uh, that accompanies this, then the first one, we're going to send that to you uh, no matter where you live in the world. And we'll have the winner here in just a minute. I'm not able to watch the chat myself. So um, here's one, Roger, that's kind of interesting, um, something I'd really never thought about. Uh, the question is, I'm planning a trip to Rocky Mountain National Park, which is in the Rockies in Colorado, as you and I know. Do I need to be worried about the tires blowing up like a balloon due to high elevation? And that road there in Rocky Mountain National Park, I've been on it, and it, it is over 12,000 feet high. I mean, you don't get out there and run around without losing your breath. So what's going on with a tire at that elevation? Um, and should this person be, should we be concerned when we're RVing at high elevations? No, you, you don't need to be. If, if you've got the right inflation in Death Valley, you're okay if you drive directly from there up to the Rocky Mountain. Mm -hmm. um, I did a post, did the math, I mean, the detailed, you know, engineering level stuff, and we're talking two or three PSI uh, difference due to an elevation change. So uh, if you're keeping an eye on your air pressure, you'll, you'll see it go up a couple of pounds with your tire pressure monitoring system. But no, the tire's not going to blow up because you're at 12,000 feet. Do tires, are tires evolving through the times? Are they getting better? Well, I, I used to talk about uh, comparing tires and cars uh, and price, going back to the 1930s, getting 5,000 miles on a tire that cost $70 in 1930, I mean, mm -hmm. that might be a, a week or a month's salary on for somebody. But 5,000 miles was considered great. Today, a lot of people get upset if they don't get 40 or 50,000 miles. Um, I wrote an article a few years ago for a, a magazine published in Europe called Tires International about, you know, tire quality and uh, performance improving. Fuel economy due to tires um, has almost doubled uh, since the 70s. Mm. Uh, traction, handling, speed ratings. So, yeah, tires have evolved dramatically. And when you consider that it, on an average for passenger tires, it takes about seven gallons of oil uh, in synthetic and stuff like that to make a passenger tire. 
and we know what the price of oil has done just in the last 20 years, but the price of tires hasn't matched that. Hmm. I mean, you and I remember 25 cent a gallon gasoline, and tires back then were still $50. Hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, do the math. Yeah. So, yeah, they've gotten a lot better, uh, and the price really has not gone up that much. Okay. Um, I'm not looking at our chat here, but I don't think we've got a winner yet. Uh, somebody's out there. This book is just ready, here for the taking. So. Um, Wife is over here waving her arm. She says she knows the answer. Yeah, well, she's ineligible because she's with you. So somebody knows the answer. Um, okay, well, I guess we'll just go ahead and take another question here. Um, I run a tire pressure monitoring system. Is pressure or temperature more important? It's tire pressure monitoring system. It is the pressure that is most important, um, not the temperature. Uh, if you have the correct pressure based on your load, uh, the temperature will be okay. Temperature of tires will run when properly loaded 20 to maybe 60 degrees Fahrenheit above ambient. Mm. Uh, and they're designed to, to tolerate that. So that we're looking at 150, 160 Fahrenheit as the upper range. Uh, tire pressure mining systems that I'm aware of have a high temperature warning, but it's up in that 160 Fahrenheit range. It's near that. So, uh, you know, if, if you saw 145, that doesn't mean you have to pull over and stop. Uh, keeping an eye on it, you'll see it goes up and down, but more importantly, have the right pressure and temperature just becomes a bit of information. Okay. You so know, we'll talk about over the campfire. When, when you're down in the southwest, you're driving down in Death Valley and Arizona, uh, on those interstates, there are a lot more tires splattered in pieces along the road. I suppose those are from truckers mostly. Um, then you yeah, see in are, cold, colder climates. They, they, but they're not doing it simply because of heat. Uh, you know, there's also trucks you see just driving through and not having failures. Um, if you don't keep the air in the tire, the temperature will go up. And that 160 can become 200 mm -hmm. if you're 20% low on air. And at 200 plus, the tire will fail. Really? Okay. Um, here's a question. If I use tire uh, valve extenders, how accurate will the temperature be? Uh, less, a little bit off. The pressure is going to be still the same. But if, if you think about it, the tire pressure mine system can only measure the temperature of the gas that's getting to the sensor. If that air has a 12-inch hose to go up and then after coming through a, a two or three inch brass valve and the hose and the valve stem are out in the in the air it's getting cooled off uh, I have run a brief test myself um, I run two tire pressure mining systems on my vehicle hmm. um, not because I, I don't trust them because I'm always running some sort of test and one is internal and one is external. And I only saw a three or five uh, degree difference inside to outside. So it's not significant. So I wouldn't worry about it. Um, again, the pressure's accurate, follow the pressure. You know, <clears throat> we're only got about five minutes left here and I'd like to uh, recommend to everybody to go to Roger's blog, rvtiresafety.com. How many articles have you got on there? Uh, we've got 150, Chuck, and, and, and that's a good point. Uh, you know, some of these questions that I've got and the, and the few you've got there uh, uh, and the stuff you get in the mail that we haven't had time, and some take more time than I've, I've really mm -hmm. got here to, to answer. Uh, I'll go through the, the dozen or so questions, and over the next couple of weeks, I will be uh, covering each of these questions in a little bit more depth. So in case somebody was taking notes or, or trying to keep up with this, uh, you'll be able to read it on the blog, rvtiresafety.com. So we'll cover each of these questions in a little bit more depth. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
uh, but I do advise people go go to Rogers uh, go to Rogers website there because he does have a an awful lot of great information there and you know one of the things we haven't even talked about Roger and we're not going to have a lot of time a few minutes left but that is you know we we talk about keeping your tires pressurized and keeping your tires healthy but what we haven't talked about is what can happen if a tire is not healthy if a, if a, a tire blows a dual blows and um, Chris Doherty did one a uh, a, uh, a video just shortly, uh, a couple months ago, about a tire had blown and it went up and it ripped up all the propane lines and the electric lines underneath the the RV and it caused it, it caused the fire, caused the uh, the RV. So I mean, these this is a tire blowout is not what you think about on your car where you just pull over and you put on it and and go your way. They can be really serious consequences on an RV, right? That's definitely true. If you think about it, and if you spend a moment looking at it, your car does not have exposed wiring or flammable gas exposed to the tire wheel well. The car manufacturers pack their wires away. The RV industry, um, at best, you've got a piece of plywood. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, a failing tire will rip up a piece of one-inch plywood pretty quick. Uh, so the damage can get pretty extensive. Uh, holding tanks, uh, you know, that kind of, I mean, a tire will just shred a holding tank. Mm -hmm. Tear out your wires, as you, as you mentioned, can, can loosen up, break uh, propane lines. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong. And on the blog, one of the advantages there is I've got a number of pictures of failed tires and I've got a couple uh, posts where I've done an autopsy on tires that the original owner said, everything was fine, I checked the inflation, and it just blew up. Mm -hmm. Well, after doing the autopsy, I had the physical evidence showing that the tire had a leak, it had lost most, if not all, of its air, and it melted the polyester that's in the body. That's 350 degrees Fahrenheit or higher it takes to melt the polyester in the body of the tire. Yep. The only way you can get that is running flat. That's zero PSI. So the, the pictures on the blog, some of them will help you understand the consequences of uh, you know what happens. And as I said, I posted more than one autopsy because some people just don't want to accept the fact that a tire can do this. And that mm -hmm. was my job, to do autopsies. I've done about 20,000 in my career. You're a forensic tire guy, huh? Yep. Okay, I got. It. Well, let's get this fast one in here. Should the inner dual on a motorhome uh, have more inflation than the outer dual because of road crown? We've only got two no. minutes, so what do you say? No, absolutely not. Um, we touched on that. You know, all tires on, on an axle should have the same inflation. And if you do a little sketch, the road crown isn't in the center of your lane. The whole lane might slope to one way. So all tires on the left are high than the ones on the right. But no, tires uh, should not have different inflation in dual. That's important, very important. Okay. So is matching dual size. Okay, okay, we're about out of time. Um, thank you, Roger, for being with us. Uh, Aaron, A-A-R-O-N-Z, Dad, won our, uh, the book. So please email. You can just send me chuck at rvtravel.com. Send me uh, the email of your, we need your place to send it to, an address. And uh, we thank you all for being with us here today. This will be available in the archives for um, ever and ever. And uh, again, uh, we'll be starting up again in the fall, but do visit our RV Travel channel on YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash RV Travel. And so for today, I'm Chuck Woodbury, editor of RVTravel.com, and Roger Marble, and thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Chuck.